Welcome to the Magic of Human Beings. I'm Carol Cristina da Silva, your host. The Magic of Human Beings was created to share extraordinary stories. I decided to have conversations with people that I love and are truly inspiring and get a glimpse why they do what they do, how they do what they do. It fills my heart with joy and gratitude to be able to share celebrate and cherish their journeys about challenge, change, transformation, creativity, and connect with one another in that human level. I will start with a quote from our guest, Giles Dooley. Each of us has a skill and we can find ways to use that skill. And by doing that together, we really can create change. Each of us has the power to create change. Yes, I totally agree with that. We are powerful creators. And Giles, he used his skills amazingly. Giles is a photographer, storyteller, and he does writing and documenting humanity and love and amplifying voices of others. I'm not going to tell you anymore because Giles can tell us. So I just invited Giles in. Hi. Hello, Giles. How are you doing? Nice to meet you. Yeah, likewise, likewise. I just get myself in camera. <laughs> I guess that's the funny thing with people are finding with Zoom and all these meetings is that suddenly they're like, oh my God, I can see myself. <laughs> well, I've been filming for the last couple of months. So I'm getting a little painfully too used to seeing myself on camera. Oh, really? <laughs> <laughs> oh, you know, it's so lovely to meet you because... I heard about you from Edson Williams, our mutual friend, many times. And uh, like it, he, he would tell me, oh, there's exhibition happenings, there is this and that, but I never managed and ta-da. Well, now we have the chance to chat. Yeah, because of Lara. Yes, absolutely. And do you know, I was looking at some of uh, like my, some of my creative projects that I've been doing for the years and I found something with the name of Edson on top and saying scars and then I was like safe clean areas for recreation and sports mm -hmm. and were you involved with that? Yeah that was one of the first projects and still hopefully will, will come to fruition at some point but yes definitely connected to that. Oh wow because yes so I have things written here, like saying how I'll be involved. And here he's saying puppet film, kids puppet show, awareness, sense of gratitude. And I, how, I don't know what was happening in my life at the time. <laughs> <laughs> so I was supposed to participate on this project and I found that and I was like, wow. So yeah, good. please think next. Yes. But anyway, I start uh, The Magic of Human Beings by you introducing yourself, like where are you born, where are you from? Sure. So um, I'm Giles Dooley, and actually I was born in London, um, in Wimbledon. So um, I'm one of the few people in London that was from London. Londoner? Um, yeah, proper. You know, my, my, my mother was a Cockney, um, so she was born in East London. So yeah, London, London was home, but now I live down by the coast in Hastings. Um, I wanted to be by the sea and, and connect to having that, that kind of ocean around me. So that's where I'm living now. Oh, and how did you start photography? So photography, you know, it's funny, a lot of people always ask me how, you know, how do you find the thing that you love? You're so lucky to have found your passion. And, and my belief is always our passion finds us. We don't find it. And for me, I was 18 years old. I had gone to America on a sports scholarship. Um, I was a boxer, a terrible, terrible boxer. Um, 
yeah, I was, I was the world's worst boxer, but I managed to get a scholarship to the States somehow. Um, and I'd gone to America to fulfill my sporting dreams when I had a car accident. And it was only a minor car accident, but it, it left me in hospital. Um, and I was unable to carry on that dream. And it was while in hospital that um, Fortune really passed a camera to me. Um, my godfather passed away and I was left his Olympus OM10 camera and a book by the war photographer Don McCullen. And those two small gifts changed my life forever. And not only was it the transformative moment in my life where I became a storyteller, I felt like I had my voice for the first time, but it's also a reminder to everybody that, that small acts, small little things that may seem unimportant can change somebody else's life completely. Yes. And something, and were you at all in your background? Did you come, were you aware of like photography or? or you know, it's, it's funny, I'm, I'm, I'm in the process of writing at the moment and, and searching back, um, you know, the history of my own life. You know, we, we often, things in our life we don't pay attention to until much later we can look back on them and see their importance. And, you know, a friend of mine has, has been inspiring me a lot recently to think back on, on my youth. And, and actually, I remember there was a guy called Mr. Mowbray when I was about 10 years old, and he... Um, he was involved in the D-Day landings in, in World War II, and I was obsessed by history as a child, obsessed by military history, which is, again, a great irony. Um, <laughs> at that stage, I, was, I didn't know what my interest was, but I knew I had to know everything about war. And so I would, I would read even at 10 years old, and I was very, very serious about it. Um, so I was interested in him because of his history in the war, but he had at school a little uh, photography group. And I joined the photography group, not because of the photography, but because I wanted to hear his stories about the war. And it was through that, I remember him taking me into a dark room for the first time and seeing photographic print appear. And I still, I still work on film. You know, that would be so 10, that'd be 40 years ago. I, exactly 40 years ago, I first saw a photographic print appear in this tray as he was processing it. And to this day, I still feel that magic. I still feel this buzz, this excitement. It's never worn off for me. Because the thing about photographic film is it's, it's a chemical reaction. It's a reaction of light and chemistry. And I feel when I see a print that it's touched by the light that was first there. It may sound a bit of a kind of you know, fantastical, fantastical way of describing it. But for me, there is a magic, there's an alchemy. I mean, it is alchemy. It is. It's, it's light reacting with silver, which is alchemy. And that reacts and then we shine light back through it and it reacts with other silver and that creates a print. So to this day, when I'm in a dark room and you've got the red light on and you have this tray and you're, you're processing and, and out of that white paper, you see an image come. And it's an image of somebody you met and you remember the light that was on their face and how that light reflected to you and you see it again. And that magic has never lost me. So that, that first moment was when I was 10 years old and this guy, Mr. Mowbray, and I was only reminded of that story today. So it's nice to be able to share it again. Oh, wow, that's beautiful. It's, I love like these moments in life that happen to us and... Well, the thing is, at the time, it didn't mean as much to me. It, it, I remember the magic of that, but I was still interested in the military. I was still interested in war and history. And I thought that's where my, my path would go. And so then, you know, it was eight years later when I got injured and got given a camera. Those things kind of clicked. And, and that's, that's what I find fascinating about the fabric of our life is when we look back, there's all these little moments, all these little insignificant things that become hugely significant when they come together and create the person that we are. Yeah. And then you got the camera, you got mm. the book. Yeah. So I... Went out and start taking photos? How? No, not really immediately. I mean, I, I'm dyslexic. So I had always been told I was stupid at school. I, I'd suffered a lot. I was held back a year when I was 12 years old. And it really kind of was, it was difficult for me. So I, when I got injured from doing my sport, I didn't know what I was going to do. I had no place at university. Um, I had no idea what what prospects I might do. Um, and suddenly this camera, I remember going out and taking photographs and I photographed everything. I was like, um, I was like a sponge. You know, I just wanted to understand this new language. It was like suddenly, somebody was speaking in my ear, a completely new language, this visual language. And I didn't quite find that I could communicate yet, 
but I knew this was my language. And, and I went out and I photographed everything from trees to bits of rubbish I'd find on the floor to self portraits to, to anything I could, anything. I was consuming it. And I lived and slept it. I, I actually put this, this dark room, I, I got like a, a basic dark room and set it up in my bedroom. <laughs> and I lived, I lived it, lived it, lived it. Like I would be up all night printing, all day taking photographs. And I was completely absorbed. And like I say, it's like suddenly discovering this language that you know is your mother tongue, but you can't speak it yet. That's what photography felt like when I, when I had it, because I can communicate visually in a way I can't communicate through words. And so suddenly I, the world changed, everything became different. I suddenly had I, a value, I thought, in the world. And that's what photography was for me. Before I thought about it as a career or what I was going to photograph, it was something much, much deeper and much more in my core. And in fact, sort of then jumping forward, just to show what I mean by that, when I was injured, and we'll mention this later, but I got injured in Afghanistan and was close to death, there was a moment where my family was basically saying their goodbyes to me. And nobody thought I'd make it through the next 24 hours from these injuries, and they took off the oxygen mask to say my last words. And I was unconscious, I was on, on so many drugs. But the only words that came out were, I said, I am still a photographer. And that's the point, is that it's, it, it's, not, it's not what I do. It's not, it's like saying I'm human. It's like saying, you know, I, I'm whatever. It, it, for me, being a photographer is simply my way of existing in this world. It's how the world makes sense to me, how I communicate with the world, how I love the world, how I get loved. And so for me, it's not really a case of, of, you know, becoming a photographer or getting the camera. No, the camera, seeing things visually, changed everything for me. Yeah, it's an extension. It's an extension of what you can... Yeah, less even as an extension. It is simply my core. It's like you, I've been muffled up until that point. I had somebody, I couldn't speak because I say language was so difficult for me. Words were so difficult for me. But when it was actually the opposite. It wasn't an extension. It was an internal thing, finally released. Oh, wow. That's beautiful. I, and I wonder if other people, like, how we find that, like, how we, how we come across that. Because as I was reading the, that first thing that, that I started reading about you saying that we all have a special skill. And... Uh, well, I, I, you know, the most important thing is to live your life intensely. And when I say live your life intensely, that doesn't mean you have to do extreme things like, you know, go to Afghanistan or climb Mount Everest. Living life intensely means when you cook your lunch, it might just be baked beans on toast, but like enjoy every moment of it. Enjoy the toast. Think about it. You know, think about the flavoring of the beans. Think about the plate it's on. Think about the light. Every, every little detail. Live everything intensely. Too many people are not living it. And for me, it's by doing that that you'll find what that passion is. You know, it's, it, you won't find it by just drifting through life. The passion comes from experiencing everything else in life. That's my belief anyway. Yeah, being touched, being in... And there's meditations that say things about just like enjoy your food now. Mm. Like connect with everything. Just have your, your food and taste it and savor it. And I, I, um, I, I think I was always like that. But, um, you know, again... We're not going to talk about it much, but very briefly, I got injured in Afghanistan you know, 10 years ago. Uh, I stepped on a landmine, so I lost my legs, my arm. Um, it's kind of an old story for me now. But the, the, the interesting part is I spent a year in hospital and a year when I didn't think I would live or would see the world again. And it reminded me of something that, that there's a South American tribe. I think, I have to be correct, Kagu, I can't remember the exact name now. K, K, anyway. Um, they take the children that they have foreseen to be the medicine men of their community or the wise people. They, they take them as children and educate them in a cave, essentially. So they're kept from the outside world and kept from everything. But they live a very privileged life within that. And they're very well uh, looked after and educated and spoiled. But they don't see the outside world. And the idea for this is then when they reach puberty, for the first time they're taken out. Now, they have been listening and learning the stories of the jaguar, of the forest, of the sun, the moon, everything, the river. And then they see these things for the first time. And the idea is they never lose their sense of wonder because they remember stuff. Most of us don't remember the first time we see all these things. But for them, they remember each time. 
for me, it was the same experience. I spent a year in hospital. Um, for 48 days, I couldn't even eat or drink. I had no, I couldn't even go to the toilet for myself for three months. So every single part. So you take back everything, every single experience, every sensory thing you can do from listening, um, from tasting, from touching, take that all away from you. And then slowly give it back a little bit at a time. And each bit, as it got given to me, I treasured. Like my hand was in a cast, I couldn't feel anything. I had nothing. But each little bit, so the first time I tasted water again, was like oh, sensory overload. The first time I heard something, at music again, it, it kind of blew me away. All these things, I got given back one at a time. And that is what I mean by living intensely, because each one of them, I kind of got to have and and feel it and, and experience it in a way that, that maybe many people don't get to do. But if you can live your life and feel like that all the time, even something bad, you know, even, even the end of a relationship or hurting yourself or leaving a job or something not working is an experience that you can feel that you're alive to be able to experience that. Which doesn't mean it's not hard or upsetting, but you should also treasure it because it means you're alive. Yeah. It means you're alive. Yeah. Wow. <laughs> and this it's up uh, what you just said i makes me think like because you already had that wonder feeling right when you're young mm. like from yeah. young age because i think like for example as our relation with nature and me like growing up as well like staring at the birds like i love looking after me and my brother would spend hours following the ants giving them little leaves and mm -hmm. the thing go still i love dance well sometimes i eat them because they get by mistake and stuck inside my honey yeah <laughs> but anyway sorry to diverse you <laughs> do you think also like having all these little bits giving back to you bit by bit and how you deal with that and how wonderful is that that has to do also because you already have this sense of wonder of living fully I mean, I, 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 can't, I can't give you that answer. I mean, yeah. like, I've always lived my life intensely, you know, from, from early age, everything for me was, was very sensory and I wanted to feel everything and taste everything, experience everything. You know, for me, the, 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 the reason I was in Afghanistan was because of the work I did. And I've been doing it for 10 years, documenting the effects of conflict. But that was because, again, for me, I never wanted to just watch something on the news. I needed to understand it. I wanted to be able to be uh, able to tell those stories, to understand those stories. So everything for me has always been very sensory. That's so, great. you know, maybe, maybe again, that comes from the challenge I have in reading that I, I, I wanted to experience everything. I, I couldn't get it from reading it. I needed to taste it. I needed to hear it. I needed to feel it. And I've always been like that, that everything in my life, I have to really push myself into it and, and have it all around me to be, let it, let it overtake me, envelop me. And then I really get a sense of those things. So that's how I was, which is why it hurt so much when it was all taken away from me and to be trapped in your own mind. You know, I had 46 days where I couldn't communicate with people apart from blinking. Now you imagine that, you know, imagine we talk about lockdown, but imagine being strapped to a bed where your hand is in a cast and you can't move it. So you can't write. You have a tube here in your throat, which means you can't speak. You have other tubes here, which means you can't even move your mouth. You have tubes in your, you're literally and utterly broken. And the only thing you can do is blink. Now, everything suddenly is lost to you. Every single sense. Like I said, I couldn't even go to the toilet for myself. You know, I had tubes doing that. No element of control over my own body. It felt like I was violated in a way because I couldn't control anything. Other people were controlling every little bit of my body. Even my breathing was regulated by a machine. I didn't have control over it. So all I had was my mind and my imagination. And that's where I had to live for quite a long time. And then as I say, you kind of, as somebody that, that always wanted sensory input, that needed sensory input all the time, now I haven't got it. So I had to develop something in my own mind and my own imagination to build a world. And that, was a transformative thing in my self-discipline, in the way I could think about things, the way I could, could control my, my emotions, all of that had to be built then. A resilience was built then. You know, I always say you don't become resilient, you, or should I say you don't make yourself resilient, it comes from circumstance. So that's what happened. So then, when we then go to the stage where I start to get everything back again, I'm a different person. 
a completely different man. And I'm able to appreciate those things that I'm giving back, those gifts, 10 times more. Like I remember the first time I touched somebody's hand again, like my brother's hand, and feeling that touch, human touch. I remember that so clearly. You know, I remember hearing words spoken to me that I could understand again. I remember, as I say, tastes again. I remember going out and feeling the sun on my face again. Every single thing is so precious. Wow. It's like giving another life. Yeah, absolutely. This is, this is my next life. And, and it's one that I'm able to, I, you know, I suffer from years of depression and I couldn't, I couldn't enjoy my life. You know, up until um, my injury, I don't think there was a time when I really felt like I was happy. And it's only in the last four or five years that I could say I know what happiness feels like. And more so than ever in the last few months, you know, I, I feel what happiness is, but I've been wanting that all my life, but I didn't know how to get there until all these experiences again. Whoa. <laughs> and uh, with photography, mm. how, how did you go to all these travels and conflicts What made you want to do this type of photography? You know, it's, it's, there was never a point when I sat down and said, this is what I want to do. I just knew it. Everything is, say, everything connects. Everything connects. And this is what I've been thinking a lot about recently. It's all these different things in my life, all these little stories. You know, my, my childhood fascination with the military. You know, uh, I used to go to uh, Normandy in France and, and visit the sites. Every, every summer, that's when my family went on holiday. We'd go in a caravan and... You know, me and my sister was a bit older than me. We'd always have one or two days where we could choose what we wanted to do. And I always go to the sites of, of where battles had happened. And sometimes I would sit there and cry. I was like 10 years old, but I'd be so overcome by everything that I would cry. And they were deeply emotional things for me. And I was fascinated already by this idea of war and, and its legacy. So again, those are things that shaped me. And then the photography, and then my experiences dealing with depression in my 20s. Um, And then coming out of that depression, I became a care worker and I was living with somebody with, with autism as their full-time support. And my dear friend, Nick, you know, I, I, I don't like to refer to myself as his carer because he was my carer, actually. He changed my life. But we spent two years, a very intense two years because he needed full-time support. And at the end of that, I started to photograph his story so that he could tell his story through my photographs. And then suddenly, it's like the universe puts all these things together this history of, of conflict and being so emotionally attached to war, my love of photography, and then the realization that I could use it to tell somebody else's story and maybe make some kind of change. And then that's where you suddenly, you found your purpose. So that moment there with yeah. need. Yeah, exactly. And it just all, all knitted together. And that's what I'm gonna say, I'm fascinated by the moment because I'm kind of going back and finding all these bits. And then you suddenly say, that's where all the stars aligned. That was the moment. That this was my destiny. You know, war and photography and storytelling uh -huh. has been my destiny, but it took me 30 years, 35 years to make sense of that because I spent 35 years hating myself, fighting myself, destroying myself through, through alcohol, drugs, all sorts of things. And then suddenly everything clicked and I realized that that was the whole, my whole life was for that purpose and still is. Fantastic. And then from there, did you just you just like decided, okay, I'm going to go to, how did you? You know, I mean, it's funny. I think a lot of people would, would sit and, and think and worry and, and try and make plans. I've always been, again, the person of my instinct that I just went, you know, I knew. It <laughs> and I went to Angola and I, I positioned myself in Angola for six months and just and said, if I'm going to do it, I have to do it. You don't, you don't sit and think and talk and read books. And, and study these things. You have to go with your feeling. And, and it's like, if this is what I'm supposed to do, then I have to be there. So I went, my, one of my good friends lived in Angola. I lived with him and I started offering my services to local charities and NGOs. And, and so, you know, there's only one way to find out if something's right and that is to immerse yourself in it. And, and that was the beginning of it. Um, and, and yeah, then as time went on, I found that photography wasn't enough, that I needed to also do more and I mean that's why we're here you know this evening because I realized that it wasn't just enough to tell somebody's story if telling their story didn't impact their lives in a positive way and you know I, I felt I was taking their stories using their stories their stories were, were maybe helping on a broader scale but they weren't helping the individuals and that had to change so I set up a, a, a charity a foundation that would mean that we had 
you know, direct positive impact on, on the people that I worked with. And it was only supposed to really start with, with a few of the families that I'd worked with for over a long period of time because I had built up a relationship with them. In fact, there's an interesting story. Um, sorry, I'm rambling a lot tonight. But no, don't worry. <laughs> I'm a rambler too. <laughs> <laughs> there was a, a, a woman who... Um, so after my injuries, I spent a year in hospital, as I said, then another year recovering. And it took about three years before I was well enough to return to work properly. But I was, and, and you know, Edson, um, our mutual friend, will testify to this. He's, he's always been there trying to support as my, as my, I don't like to say agent, but as my, my sort of partner in crime. Um, but nobody gave me work. Nobody gave me work. All the magazines I worked for, for 20 years, turned their back on me. And it took me a long time to realize that, that they had done that, that they didn't trust that a triple amputee, a disabled man, a cripple could be a photographer. And to this day, most of them have still turned. So I had to prove it myself by going out there and doing, which is what I did. And one of the people I met was a woman called Khalud, who was a Syrian refugee living in Lebanon, who had been paralyzed by a sniper. And she was living in a makeshift tent and I remember turning up and photographing her and her family and actually many, many other families. And years later, when I set up the foundation, we were able to help Khalud and get her relocated actually to Holland, um, where she lives now. And I remember her once saying that she owed me her life and she owed me everything. And I said, no, you missed the point. I said, because when I first met you, I had lost my life. I had nothing and you gave me my life back because she trusted me to tell her story. She didn't look at me and say, I don't know if you're capable of doing it. You've only got one arm. How do I know you can be a photographer? She trusted me to tell her story. And in doing that, she enabled me to become a photographer again and have my life back. So I always say that actually it was the other way around that I owed her everything. So, so all these relationships, as I say, are important. And it's, it's so th this is where the charity came from. And I guess I'm lucky because my experience, my experience means that I know what it's like to need help. And God knows I hate asking for help. You know, I, I and I still to this day struggle with it. But there was a point when you are so broken, when you have nothing left that you have to ask for help. And, and so obviously with my injuries, that's what I needed. And there were sort of two groups of people, people that looked at me and said, OK, we'll make sure you don't have to work again. You don't have to worry about anything. You know, we'll set you up. And the other people were like, OK, how do we get you working again? How do we get your life back? Because they did not see me as somebody with a disability. They just saw me with somebody that was having to go through something and readapt and find new ways of doing things. Now, that was what kept me alive was those people, the people that just saw that as a practical problem. Like, how do we get you working? And that's what I wanted to do when I set up a charity is, is not to use that word charity, you know, but to be a support network, to say to people, look, you're having a shit time. You know, war has impacted your life. This is what's going through. But I don't have sympathy for you. I don't look at you as weak or broken. Yeah. I believe that the circumstances have, have put you in this situation. Yeah. So work together to get you back on track so you don't need any more help. And that's what we do. And that's how we are as a foundation. Wow. You see, that's the thing. It's not giving names or putting them in that position that it's uh, it's like it's like this happened to you and i'm very sorry that situation happened but what shall we do what can we do exactly and but you know but we we this idea of, of sympathy this idea of, of of pity is something we have to break away from you know i was speaking to somebody just a, a few days ago about how with ngos that they will tend to put um, on the cover of any fundraising materials a mother and child and they're very unlikely to put a man on the front. Now, why is that? It's because they believe that they'll raise, raise more money if they have a woman and child on the front. Why? Because we're programmed to feel sympathy for that person. Mm -hmm. Right? Now, that's wrong. And those are the kind of things we have to break away from. You know, why should we program that if I see a woman and a child, I'm supposed to think they're more vulnerable than the man or they are? You know, all these things we have to break down. And that's what we're getting, what we're trying to do as a charity is say that, you know, I'm not looking at these people and thinking we feel sorry for them. No, actually, the problem is us. 
you know, most of these problems are caused by colonialization, by imperialism, by Western um, ideas of, of money. So actually what we're trying to do is just fix some of the things that we fucked up. Excuse my language. <laughs> some of the things we've messed up. <laughs> and and, and that's, it's, we're the ones with the problem. You know, yeah. like we have a project in Rwanda called Land for Women, which is about setting up cooperative farms and we give the land to the women so they have the power. You know, normally an NGO would own the land. You would still have the power. If you give the land to the women, they have the power and then they choose to work with us. Now, I don't feel sorry for those women. I'm angry for those women because it's through uh, Western interference that they were in that position in the first place. So all I'm trying to do is help correct it to give them back the power that's rightfully theirs. That is rightfully theirs. Indeed. Wow. And on that note about those women, Yeah. I want to know a bit about Olid Mute Tampura. Yeah. Because I heard her story and the forgiveness. It's mm. so amazing. Yeah, Olive, Olive is, is a wonderful, wonderful woman and, and a dear friend and somebody that um that is just a joy to be around. I mean I get emotional when I think about it. She's just um she's life, you know. Um she's somebody who's living a life intensely. And I think actually a lot of the people that I work with have that same experience. And it's a long story and it's a detailed story, but um, in, in brief, which you can't really do justice to her story, but uh, during the Rwandan genocide, she was actually... Just one second, yeah. please. Hello? 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 So, sorry for a second, but my yeah. flatmates, they went climbing And I don't think they closed the front door properly because I heard the banging. Now I hear someone is in the house. Now they're going down. Sorry about that. It's all right. It's just turned into a mystery. Yeah, I know. Yes, I'm okay. Thank you. Sorry, Giles. It's okay. She, she said it's closed, but I don't know if the person closed, but no one answered me, which was very strange. Well, you've got but... a lot of witnesses if anything happens. Yes, <laughs> And I locked the door. <laughs> so now they are gone. I do. He didn't answer. I thought someone got in the house. Sorry. Well, hey. it's so good. Good. This is being Brazilian. And we have many people that invade our house. <laughs> <laughs> so we think that I guess the English people don't worry when they hear different things. But for me, it's like, it's triggered something that I'm like. So okay. sorry about that. <laughs> no, but I'm glad everything's okay. 
Yes. So I was asking about Olive. Yeah. Because her story, it's, it got me, when I heard, I got me so emotional about forgiveness. And we should all, like, know something like about forgiveness. What is forgiveness? What means forgiveness? Could yeah. you share with us, please? Yeah, yeah. I mean, as I say, it's, her story's a very long one, so I don't really like to, to, to shorten it too much. But... Okay. Um, but essentially, she was giving birth uh, to her third child uh, when the Rwandan genocide began. Um, and as she was literally giving birth, her village was attacked and um, her children were killed. Her husband was killed. Her whole family was killed. So she was just left with this baby, this newly born baby in the hospital, um, while every person that she knew was dying. And it's an incredible irony it's beyond irony, but, but the situation of, of at the moment of birth was actually the moment of, of, of the loss of everybody that she knew. Um, she was then parted from the baby for various reasons. She had to leave the baby. She survived various other attempts to kill her um, and then ended up uh, in a very bad situation, was in hospital for several months. Finally went back to her village because she wanted to bury her family, um, but nobody knew where the bodies were. Um, it, it, it was kind of the, the village was destroyed. She adopted six babies that had survived the genocide and took them um, and then lived in, in Kigali for a while. Um, eventually, you know, she went through a very difficult time there and eventually went back to her village. And when she returned to her village, this was now 10, 15 years after the genocide, many of the people that had been involved in the killing of her family had been released from jail or had returned because there was, there was an amnesty to a certain level. And so she would see the people that she knew directly was responsible for killing her family every day. And it was destroying her and more importantly for her, destroying the lives of her children because, you know, obviously it was bringing back a lot of trauma for her. And then that's when she made the, the decision that you're kind of referring to, which is remarkable, which is that she decided for her to move forward she would have to forgive the people that perpetrated the crimes. So it's an interesting idea, this idea of forgiveness. It doesn't necessarily mean that you forget what happened. It doesn't mean that you, um, you absolve them of guilt. I think what you're saying is that you release yourself from their hold. And I think that's the important thing of how I see it is what mm -hmm. happened. She was not absolving them. She was not letting them necessarily have their peace. But she was saying in her forgiveness, you do not have this power over me anymore. You know, you have caused me this much pain. You have caused me this much sorrow. But I will not let you destroy the rest of my life. So I forgive you. I, I, I move on from this. So that's what she did is she forgave the people that perpetrated the crimes. She would notice around her house, um, things like the roof had been repaired or the garden had been dug. And, and these people were coming and doing things when she was away. And then eventually the, the leader of the militia during the time of the genocide came and knocked on her door. And when she opened it, she was terrified. She had witnessed some of the killings that he had done sort of 15 years before. So she was worried that she wanted, you know, to be silenced by him. But actually he, he stood there and he said, I know what you've been doing. I know the forgiveness you've, you've given. And, I will show you where we, where we buried the bodies. So she was taken to an unmarked grave. And the next day, uh, the government came, they dug it up and they found about 150 bodies in this unmarked grave, 15 years after the genocide. And in Olive's own words, it was her forgiveness that meant the whole village was able to lay their ghosts to rest because everybody could bury their dead then. Wow. And what's interesting is this notion of forgiveness that um, as we, me and Olive have become good friends, um, she is still friends with this killer, the main, the main guy that was involved. It's again, it's a hugely complicated story, but there's a family relationship there as well. He's actually, a, a, was married to her aunt, he's an uncle. But he, this, this is what happened in Rwanda, people turn on, on even their own families if they're from the, the, different, the different ethnic groups. So she took me to meet him one day. And what was really interesting is Olive is somebody who's now full of life, full of energy. She's a big part of a community. She has the adopted children. She has life, energy, so much energy. I mean, we, we, whenever I see her, we, we cook, 
we drink quite a few beers and we dance through the night. I mean, we just have so much fun. But she takes me to meet the killer. And he was in this room that was, was dark. He has nothing, he has no body. And it was like the energy was sucked out when I walked into that room. I, I, I got a sense of walking into death when I went into that room. Uh, my translator couldn't stay in the room. She was so um, upset by the energy that she left. And I sat there with this man and he was asking for my forgiveness and I wouldn't give it to him. And it was interesting because, as I say, when I left, he was the person destroyed. He was the person broken. The person that perpetrated these crimes to Olive and her family. Olive was living a life full of, of energy and joy. And I think that all comes because of her forgiveness. But as I say, the, the, the understanding I have it is not forgiveness. She did not absolve him of his crimes because he, mm -hmm. what she was doing was releasing herself from his grip and saying, you do not have power on me. And interestingly, about a week later, it was her birthday. And she'd invited him to her birthday because he's still part of the family. It's a very complicated um, thing. And he tried to exert his power again. And this is the, 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 the insidious nature of men, and especially men of, of this sort, that he still wants to insert his power. So I, I had kind of thrown a party for Olive. And he stood up as the head of the family, which he still is, despite all the crimes. He stood up to, to basically say that he you know, was, was thanking me and blah, blah, blah. And I told him to sit down. I said, don't speak in my presence. Because he was still trying to assert his power over Olive. Mm -hmm. It was the first time I'd seen Olive go quiet and tremble because he was doing this. And, you know, she soon kind of recovered and came back from it and, and he left. But it's, it's this power dynamic, you know, it goes beyond war, goes beyond suffering, which is men trying to control women through power, through violence. And it's not just in, you know, in places like Rwanda, it was the sexual violence as well as the killings that people tried to insert their power. And for many, many people, and many of the, the, the communities we work with, they're still under that power, even though the men have gone, have been killed, have been arrested. And what Olive did, what Olive did was release herself from his power and the power of the other men that had done this to and, and reclaim, and they are the broken ones now in that community. They are the ones that have no lives, that live in darkness, that have no joy. And Olive and her family have it. And I don't know how she did it, but it is that act of forgiveness, but in the sense of saying, you do not have control over me anymore. I have my life now. I'm breaking away from you. And that's how I understand her forgiveness. Yeah. And through her forgiveness and the whole village comes mm. Absolutely. Finding the grave and... Yeah. And so what we did, and then, and then foundation is, then I, I said to Olive, how can I help you? You know, what can I, what can I do? And, and she um, had a cooperative of women that were survivors of sexual violence, and they, they, they grew potatoes. And I initially thought, well, maybe we could set something up a market or whatever. And then she's like, well, if we had the land, wouldn't it, it, would, it would make it so different. So that's what we did, is we, we raised the funds, and I was able to go back there. And for me, one of the, the, the proudest moments I've ever had in my life, which I don't often say actually being proud of anything I've done, but there was a moment there where as a community, we were able to raise the funds and speaking on behalf of the community that is Legacy of War Foundation, I was able to, to uh, we had a sort of gathering of the women and I was able to say to them that thanks to the generosity of, of people all around the world, that land that you work on every day, that land that breaks your back, that land that makes your hands bleed, that makes your knees ache, that land that every day you suffer in, that land is now your land. Wow. And that was the moment that, that oh, man. And... they power again. And that for me was a hugely emotional thing. You can't empower someone. I can't empower you. I can't empower the women. But I can help take down the barriers that stop people empowering themselves. And people did that for me after my injury. They took down the barriers that meant as somebody with a disability, I was being limited. They gave me the opportunity to empower myself. And that's what I was able to do um, through our community was to bring down some of those barriers that were stopping those women being able to empower themselves. And empowering women in communities is so empowering. 
Well, I mean, it's just like, as I say, it's, 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 it's about correcting wrongs. It's not about doing anything amazing. You know, it's not about, um, you know, me or the charity or anything having these great fundamental ideas. No, we're just looking at problems and saying, well, how can we correct them? And that's why One for Lara was inspired. You know, I was in, in DR Congo, and this is kind of what started this whole conversation. Why yeah. I'm here is, you know, I was in DR Congo just a few months ago, and I was at a um, an orphanage run by uh, Mama Jane, who's Mama Jane is somebody I've met many times and got to know the community there very well. Um, and again, it's a it's a place full of incredible stories. There's there's a young man called Samuel, who I met there a couple of years ago, and Samuel. Um, again, had had one of the most traumatic experiences you could imagine, where his family was attacked in, in, in Goma when he was a baby, um, literally months old. And it was through the night, and they came in, they, they hacked the whole family to death with machetes, uh, these attackers. And he was lying in between his parents. And he was actually suckling on his mother's breast when they attacked. And as they hacked everybody, they didn't see him under the bodies. As they were hacking everything, his arm was hacked off. He had scars across his body. And he was found three days later still suckling on his mother's breast under all these dead bodies, mutilated bodies. Um, as I say, and he'd lost his arm in this attack. He was taken to this orphanage and brought up by Mama Jane. And when I met him, he'd always wanted to be a photographer. But he had uh, told or been told that you couldn't be one. You have one arm. You know, it's not, it's not something you can do. Now... You know, people go like, oh, that's shocking. But you know what? Even in this society, I'm being always being told what I can and cannot do. People are always telling people with disabilities what their limitations are. Very rarely will you hear the person with a disability telling you their limitations. The limitations are put on us by society and by others. And that's what had happened to Samuel. But I was able to say to him, well, look at me. You know, I'm doing all right. Um, you know, so why can't you? And so this time when I went back, I was able to take him a camera and get him kind of going on his own photographic journey. And again, that's not sympathy. That is just enabling him to yeah. fulfill his potential, to, to be able to, to do, it's taking down the barrier. The barrier was two things. One, he was told he couldn't do it. Well, I can set an example, that my little bit I can do. The second thing is he didn't have a camera. Well, I give him the camera. That's all it was. Now he's empowered to do what he wants. Okay. You know, and already he's taking photographs, doing things like weddings and using that money to fund things at the orphanage. So they've just got their first look battery, so they have a little TV for the first time. And that is him able to do that. So he's now doing things that take down the barriers for those orphans. And that's the power of all of us doing our part. So anyway, so that's a story within a story. And um, how old is he now? So he's 22 now, 20, 22, and, and still living at the orphanage and, and, and becoming somebody that works there as well. But as I say, it's an important thing for me because um, as somebody living with a disability, I'm constantly being told, you know, where, where my boundaries are, what I can do, what I can't do. And I, I just have a simple feeling that anybody that tells me that you have a choice, either get out of my way, you know, or, or, or stand by me, but don't keep telling people what you can and can't do. And that's the same for people telling women. It's the same for people telling people with, with you know, different backgrounds, everything. People are constantly telling others how to live their lives and what they can and can't achieve. And we have to stop doing that. And it's very much the same with, with projects like in, in DR Congo, where people are, putting expectations on what these orphans can achieve, what they're able to do. And actually, they can achieve anything if given the right support. But the situation is desperate. You know, the, the, the situation in Goma is getting worse because of the whole world going into lockdown with COVID. There's less money going through. Things are changing all around. So the kids are going hungry. You know, they get maybe get one meal a day at the moment. Um, and it was that that inspired the amazing, you know, Lara to do these incredible um, handstands every Thanks, Sunday. Man. Yeah, to, to raise money. And you know what? It's, that's what keeps me going and keeps inspiring me is the way that somebody like Lara, who's 10 years old, can say, I need to change the world and I need to do something about it. And she is doing exactly that. She's not sitting back going, this is a terrible situation. I feel terrible about it. And then getting on with her life. She's saying no. And she's empowered to do something about it. She is in a position where she can do something. And she is. And that, to me, is the most beautiful and wonderful thing. And I'm incredibly grateful to her because, as I say, it's that energy that keeps me going through my difficult times and keeps me doing that hard work. Indeed. And so am I. Because, look, she's empowered. She got me talking, got me researching, got me. And Edson is saying, hell yes. Join <laughs> me or get out of my way. Mm -hmm. <laughs> 
end up the I forgot my, I'm, one thing I watch you and her talking mm. and uh, it's I love when she ask about uh, what do the kids do for fun yeah and but you know I mean that's that's you know wonderful things that kids everywhere will will find joy will be able to do things but as I say, it's, it's, we also have to be, always be careful with those things that we don't over romanticize. You know, the kids will find ways to be joyful. They'll, they'll find ways to laugh, they'll do whatever. But, you know, it's, it's our responsibility to make sure that everybody has an equal footing in this life. Everybody has the same opportunities. It doesn't matter where you're born. It doesn't matter um, what religion you are, what sex you are. It doesn't matter whether you have a disability or not. It's for those of us in a position of privilege. Yeah make sure that there's a level playing field for everybody. And, you know, that's exactly what, what Lara's saying and trying to do. That's what Edson's supporting. That's what I believe. That's what you believe. But we all have to actually take action to make that happen. It's not enough just to think about it and talk about it. And so, yeah, that, that for me is, is the responsibility that we all bear. It's what I try and do with my life as best I can. Um, but we all have to do more and we all have to keep pushing because, yes, those kids will find ways to laugh. They'll find ways to, to joke, to find energy in life but at the moment they have we need help yes and to have a healthy life and to achieve yeah. what they can up to us and uh you can have finding uh in my link legacy of our foundation and lara also handstands for mm -hmm. goma which yep. is the handstands that will tomorrow is the last day so if you can please click in the link and go there and donate to help so Exactly. So click on your link or go to the Legacy of War Legacy Foundation. Legacy of War Foundation. And I think your... Legacy of our War Foundation on my link as well. So they can yep. go and to... It's on mine as well. So just go there. You'll be able to find more information about how to support Lara and what she's doing to support Lab for Women, to support the other projects that we're doing and keep spreading the word and, and keep believing that each one of us, as you said at the beginning of this, has the power to create change through our own skills and own abilities. We are powerful creators. Once each of us start realizing that. Well, the way I would see it is, is what I document is what powerful destroyers we are. You know, we are capable ah. of destroying right? <laughs> everything that, that I... Was thing, yeah, of course. No, that is, just shows how powerful we are when we put our minds to things. But unfortunately, too often, men have put their power into destroying, into mm -hmm. greed, into those things. We have to switch that. But also, it is an example to us. So when people say to me, how can we overcome all these things? I'm like, but that's the human mind that created the disasters, that created the wars. So we have the power to correct that. To, to, yeah, we have power we, to correct that. Yeah. That same strength, that same energy, the same funding that we put into war and death and destruction. And let's put it in to changing the world and making sure that we take down those barriers so that everybody has the same opportunities that we take for granted. And what I love about the Legacy of War Foundation, it's because you had this experience on the field, like with different NGOs and charities or organizations, that you saw what it works and what it doesn't work. So you started creating, setting something different there. I wanted to create something different. I wanted to create something that was localized, uh, that's, that's female-led, um, that has a different vision of how the world can be. Um, and it's not really about looking at other NGOs and thinking they were doing right or wrong. I just looked at it and think, you know what? It's relatively simple. If you can provide security for people and you can provide education for people, then anything's possible. And, you know, there are so many people that sit and try and work out what are the solutions to this problem, this problem, this problem. That's the solution. It's not actually whether we have the solution, it's whether we choose to implement them. And as I say, we have just a very simple way of, of just wanting to help people in the same way that I was helped because I'm living proof that with the right support, the right love, then anything is, is achievable despite people telling me it's not. Yes. And what's next for the Legacy what's of Foundation? Leg Continue with all the... Oh, we, we never stop. I mean, we have a lot yeah. of projects. We're, we're, we're starting actually a, a, a farming project in the UK, which I'm really excited about, um, which is about bringing urban gardening. We're going to expand the Rwandan project. We've got two new farms opening there this year. Um, we're looking to do, obviously, in DR Congo, we're going to try and make sure that that orphanage becomes self-sufficient. We're looking at doing projects in Iraq, which just opened up officially in Libya. Um, and for me personally, um, I see months ahead of, of the happiest months of my life.
and they can keep getting happier and happier. And that's because of the opportunities that were given to me. Oh. So I'm a bit tongue-tied now. I'm quite emotional thinking about things. Oh, Jai, thank you so much. Now I'm going to ask these two questions that I always ask, which is, oh. if you had a superpower, what would that be? <laughs> a superpower? Yeah. Oh, that's a hard one. Um, you know, I, I, it's funny, a superpower. I couldn't think of anything worse, you know? I, I wouldn't want something that, that, that somehow was a burden like that. So for me, you know what? I mean, it's, it's easy to think all those things that will help others and, and, and do the rest and all the rest of it. Um, I would choose to... I would choose to, God, oh, there's nothing I want like that. There is no superpower that I want. I want to be completely normal like everybody else. I would hate to be different. I'd hate to be super. And it's, it's actually, I'm, the reason I'm funny about it is because, you know, having gone through my injuries and, and all those things, so often you get called, oh, you're superhuman. You're super for what you're able to do. And so in a weird way, it's like my, my friend's kids, call me like Superman. It's, it's all those things. And actually, there is nothing. I'm just a survivor that's trying to rebuild his life, um, like many, many other people around the world. And there's nothing super about that. I don't think anybody like me wants to be seen as an inspiration or anything different. Like myself, like Olive, like Hulu, the woman I mentioned, like the orphans in DR Congo and Samuel. We just want to be exactly the same as everybody else, to be respected in the same way, to be treated in the same way, and to give them the opportunities in the same way. And that's when equality comes. So equality is not just about looking down on somebody. It's also about putting somebody on a pedestal that's not true and creating something that's superhuman that's not superhuman. So sorry, it's a very, very boring answer. But <laughs> I, one, no, but that's if I could choose that's one super, superpower, it, it would actually be to have none. To be, just to be. Yeah, to be. Well, just to be. Yeah. And if you could have, if you, there was a travel machine where would you go? Um, I'd probably go back to uh, February the 6th, 2011, and just tell myself to watch where you're walking tomorrow. <laughs> <laughs> I'd just like tap myself on the shoulder and just say, like, just go the other way. <laughs> like, uh... <laughs> no, you know, stay home today, stay yeah. home today, or... In all seriousness, I mean, if I had the choice to go back to any, any moment in history, um, it would go back to 78 days ago. And I'll leave it at that. Okay. Oh, Giles, thank you. And there is this quote from Maya Angelou that I think it, it's perfect for all we've been talking. Do the best you can until you know better then when you know better do better true giles thank you no absolute pleasure um i'm glad nobody sneaks into your um your room as we <laughs> um and also just a huge 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 thank you to everybody that supports legacy of war a huge, huge thank you to Lara for what she's doing, for inspiring not just me, but loads and loads of other people. Um, yes. Yeah. Keep doing and what you can go in our videos, in the links. Yeah. And go there and donate. That would be wonderful. Okay. Lots of love to everyone. You and I hope I meet you someday in person. No doubt. No doubt. Yeah. So much love and thank you so much. Pleasure. Bye. Bye-bye.